Good morning, and it's wonderful, as I said to the children, it's wonderful to be able to share with you. Today's installment in our virtual worship times is for January the 23rd, and we are, as I mentioned a couple of times now, making our way through the book of Job. I'd like to remind you that should you like to engage in some conversation about the book of Job and some of the things that are shared in this series, please join us for Talk Back. And if you'd like to know more about that, John Dixon will send you the link. And uh, you can certainly ask me any questions you might have. There is a question sheet that we use to sort of spur discussion. So if you do not receive that and would like to have it, uh, just let us know and we'll make sure that you get it. Let's begin our time of worship with prayer. Your law is perfect, O God. Your ways are just. We praise you for Christ who makes known your word. Gold's value is nothing compared to the salvation you offer. The sweetness of honey is but a foretaste of the feast you prepare. Made alive by your mercy and renewed in your spirit, we come adoring your goodness, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hear the call to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is sure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Let us worship God. Our first hymn today is How Majestic Is Your Name, and it focuses on the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Almighty God that we serve. Majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God. Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. Our next song is called Build My Life, and it's speaking about our foundation being the love of Christ. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Today is our third stop in our little journey through the book of Job. It's a bit of a lengthy passage I'm going to share with you, but it's an important one because it sets the stage for many of the weeks ahead of us when we go through the poetry section of the book of Job. So we're going to start reading at Job 2, verse 11, and going on through uh, chapter 3 to verse 26. Now when Job's three friends heard all of, of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Na Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw, what, saw that his suffering was very great. And then chapter 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, Let the day perish on which I was born, in the night that said, that said, a man-child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, or light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, that night let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Yes, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry be heard. Sorry, let no joyful cry be heard in it. That those curse it who curse the sea. Those who are skilled to rouse up the Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. 
Let it hope for light, but have none. May it not see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? Why were there knees to receive me or breasts to give me to suck? Now I would be lying down and quiet. I would be asleep, then I would be at rest. With kings and counselors of the earth who rebuild ruins for themselves, or with princes who have gold, who fill their houses with silver, or why was I not buried like a stillborn child, like an infant that never sees the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of their taskmaster. The great and the small are there, and the slaves are free from their masters. Why is light given to one in misery, and life to the bitter in soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave? Why is light given to one who cannot see the way, whom God has fenced in, for my sighing comes like my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With friends like this. The old story goes that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson decided to go on a camping trip. And after a good dinner and a bottle of wine, they retired for the night to get some sleep. Uh, some hours later, Holmes wakes up and nudges his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what do you see? I see millions and millions of stars, Holmes replied to him. Or, oh, sorry, million millions of stars, Holmes replies Watson. And what do you deduce from what you see? Well, Watson ponders for a moment and says, Well, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately quarter past three. Meteorolo meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and uh, an insignificant part of the universe. But what does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes is silent for a moment and says, Watson, you idiot. Someone has stolen our tent. You know, friendship is a funny thing, isn't it? Most of us want friends, but often we want friends on our terms. We all have in our lives fair weather friends, people who are quite willing to interact with us as long as things are going okay for us. But they seem to disappear when the going gets rough. Friends who abide with us in the darkest days are rare friends indeed. That is why the story of Jesus in the garden before the crucifixion is so very painful to read. He took Peter, James, and John, which we now think of as the inner circle of his disciples, and asked them to go with him to pray. And as we know, they fell asleep. It portrays powerfully just how utterly alone Jesus is in that moment. Our friend Job is utterly alone when we see him in chapter 2. We find him on a rubbish pile, an ash heap, all alone. His wife is gone, and his only companion, it seems, is an old pottery shard. I suspect that as he dwelled on that garbage pile, his mind would have been flooded with very painful memories of his children and of his former glory. What happens now presses home the loneliness of Job as never before. The chapter begins well enough. Job's three friends have heard of this disaster that has befallen him. 
Now, it took some time to get to Job, as there was a delay in the news getting to them, and then, of course, the delay of traveling. But they made their way to the rubbish heap on which Job sat. The word friend in wisdom literature is a much richer word than we use today. Friends mentioned in Job are men who stuck closer than a brother, kind of like what we see with Jonathan and David. We are immediately heartened to know that Job had friends like this. And we read that they came together to see Job, meaning that they first made arrangements to meet and then they came. It could have been weeks before they got there due to distance and arrangements. They came together perhaps because they know it will be very challenging to comfort Job as just one individual. These three men were not fair weather friends. And until they actually begin to speak, everything is a great comfort to Job. They have come to show him sympathy, which means to enter into his grief and comfort him as a way to ease his pain. These men are very sincere in their desire to help their friend Job. Now, just to clarify, the Hebrew word for comfort, nechem, is not the same as empathy. Empathy means to try and feel as the other person is feeling. Nechem means taking action. It primarily means speaking to the one who is suffering, speaking to their heart and to their mind. When Joseph comforted his brothers in the book of Genesis, he did so as a way to lessen their fearfulness of him. Now, we don't know a whole lot about these three friends. The most we can deduce is about Eliphaz, who is, who is from Teman, which is an Edomite town. It may be important to note that his hometown as Edom was renowned as a place of great wisdom. In Obadiah chapter 8, God states to the prophet that he will destroy the wise men of Edom. There are many things to know as they come close to Job. They found him, as I mentioned, in the rubbish pile near the city. They struggled to recognize him. He was so pale and thin and racked with guilt. Some of us have experienced this visiting a friend or a family member who has experienced a tremendous tragedy and we are shocked at how they have changed. There was no friendly embrace here as they probably had in the past. And instead, Job seems like a stranger to them. We read their first response was, they wept. Not with sad tears, but in shock at the fact that this dear friend of theirs was now in a far off place. A place they could not reach themselves. Job, as I mentioned before, had torn his robe. So in solidarity, his three friends tear their robes as well. They pour dust on their head as symbols of death. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. They sit on the ground, not on cushions, not on carpets. Being on the ground symbolizes being close to the place of death, which in Hebrew is Sheol. We read that they sit for seven days and seven nights, like the Jewish wake called a shiva. Job, this great man, has been reduced to this unrecognizable heap on a rubbish pile. If for the most part Job's friends get things wrong, at least at the very beginning they get it right and just simply being there for Job. The seven days of silence indicate that the three friends have already begun to see Job as a dead man. You don't talk to a dead man, you simply mourn over one. Now, whatever this silence means, it just underscores how very alone Job is. The three friends can sympathize to a point, but they will fail to comfort Job. Suffering does that to us. It cuts us off from other people. 
Even a shared loss is experienced differently by each person. It's one of the reasons, and actually statistics have proven this, that couples who have lost a child quite often separate and divorce. You see, they just can't comfort each other. They suffer differently in their loss. Job's suffering foreshadows another person who begged his friends to sit and wait with him while he was in utter anguish. Jesus said, My soul is very sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and watch. Then on the cross, echoing Job centuries before, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Jesus suffered, but his deepest suffering may be the fact that he was lonely. He was dwelling in loneliness. In response to the pain he is experiencing, Job then begins this soliloquy, expressing his grief and the depth of his suffering. Job really isn't speaking to his friends at this moment, or really even to God. He's really speaking to himself. We begin to see the heart of the matter in this book of Job. A big question for all of us is, can we be absolutely devastated to the point of sitting on a rubbish heap of dreams and aspirations and still can we claim that we walk with Christ? It's not an idle question. In today's evangelical church, there is a strong and enticing trend that people of true faith will never hurt or suffer and will prosper as never before. Have faith in Jesus, we are told, and you will never be poor, suffer depression or anxiety or physical distress. The challenge to this idea comes from this chapter of the book of Job. Job actually suffers because he is faithful. He was blameless, remember? We read that earlier in the book. Satan wanted to go after him because he was godly, not because he wasn't. So Job is at the end of his rope. He begins to curse the very day he was born. Chapter after chapter, Job, this God-fearing man, laments and protests his situation. And we dare not try to soften this. And we must remember that at the end of the book, God says Job has spoken correctly about him. Now, Satan has done a thorough job going after Job. His property, his children, his physical body. But we often forget that Satan also went after Job's heart. Here in chapter 3 and several times throughout the book of Job, we finally hear of his great internal pain. His pain is real. And it is dishonest to say that it isn't real or to water it down in any way. Job's words today include a curse. Not a curse of God as Satan said he would utter and his wife encouraged him to utter. He curses the very day he was born. He even curses the night he was conceived. Job takes words that express darkness and he heaps them on the day of his conception and the day of his birth. The darkness is not about the number of lumens available, but really speaks about the darkness of death. It is a darkness like being in a mine shaft. In Amos 5, verse 8, we read that God brings salvation. He turns darkness into mourning. Job wants this all-consuming darkness to take the day of his birth so he can avoid all the deep, heart-wrenching pain. He longs, he says, for the Leviathan, that creature of chaos, to rise up and wipe his day of birth completely off the earth. Do you remember in the Lord of the Rings when the Fellowship of the Ring makes its way through the mines of Moria? And in the process, they awaken that terrible beast of the lake. A beast that causes so much havoc. Jesus, or Job wants to see this on himself. Job then undertakes an anguished lament that's divided into two parts. 
Both parts begin with the central question of the whole book, why? One image that emerges is Job's desire to go to the place of the dead, which is, as I mentioned, the place called Sheol. Job acknowledges that no matter how powerful or how rich you are, everyone will eventually end up there. Job has nothing. So why not go now? End this suffering. If I had to be born, he says, why could I not be still born? Can you imagine? Job knows no rest, no peace, because he is now fully identified with the weak and the powerless. He is wallowing in pain because he cannot understand why this is happening to him. Why does a man who is a believer, a man of godliness and piety, suffer such mind-numbing pain? It shakes the very foundation of how Job believed the world worked. So Job ends his speech with a desperate question. Job's question is not about Job individually, but really about all people. It is from God we receive good things and bad things, he says. There is a bitterness of soul, which means deep distress that just crushes us. Death now is the treasure that Job seeks. He figures... <laughs> that at least in death he might understand all of this. In verse 23, he says that he himself and others are walking on a way that is hidden from God or hidden from God's blessing. It is a God-forsaken walk. That's what it means. Job is feeling hedged in. His world is shrinking and he feels trapped. He says poignantly, for my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Job is shouting with everything he's got left. Why God? The application of this chapter for you and for, uh, for me is very, very important. We need to recognize that into the life of a believer, when the future looks bleak, and we can only look back with regret. Like Job, we have looked heavenward and we too have asked, why God? But even in the darkest moments, we cannot avoid God. C.S. Lewis wrote a wonderful little book, a personal reflection of his, about his experience of dealing with the death of his beloved wife, Joy. It's a book called A Grief Observed. And he finds himself echoing Job when he says, where is God, or asks the question, where is God in this darkness? And Lewis writes this. This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him. If you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But you go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, a sound of bolting and a double bolting on the inside, and after that, silence. You may well turn away. The longer you wait, the more empath emphatic your silence will become. There is no light in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once. Yet Job cannot turn away from that door. He's a restless man. Job cannot abide the way things are. He's gushing forth energy to discover why God has done this to him. A restless man is not a defeated man. If there is no hope, then why bother asking the question, why? And Job asks why over and over again. Chapter 3 ends with Job sitting with his three friends who want to comfort Job but just don't know how. Job's experience foreshadows, of course, another great man, the greatest man really, who understands the deepest of darkness because he experienced it for all of us. 
The cross is a testament to the emptiness of those who shout to us in distress. Cheer up, pull yourself together. Such sentiments only just add to our pain, making us feel guilty that our faith does not lead us to smile even when the roof of our lives is crashing in. What is most beautiful, to me anyway, are those believers who, despite the torment of life, rise out of the ashes to do something profoundly incredible. I'm sure you have perhaps never heard the troubling story of, of William Cowper. He noted poet and hymn writer. His life was full of tragedy from an early age. His mother died when he was only six. And his father sent him off to a boarding school where he was for years cruelly bullied, probably affecting his mental health for the rest of his life. His fiancée's father forbade his marriage to his daughter. He had several mental breakdowns and three times he tried to take his own life. He was committed to an asylum where he met a Christian who six months later led him to Jesus. It was an amazing change in his life. Yet four more times he sunk into depression. One of the last things he is said to have uttered before he died in, 18, in 1800 was, I feel utterly, utter, unalterable sorry, despair. Despite it all, no one doubts that Cowper was a believer. He left to the church some of its more beloved hymns like, Oh, for a closer walk with God. The hymn talks about his own personal despair was like an idol that was keeping him from God. Cowper's despair had nothing to do with backsliding, nor was Job's despair. At play here is the painful reality that all of us, at some point, despite our faith, look back at something in our lives with regret. So Job sits with his three friends, but he's still alone. Alone in his misery, alone with his dark thoughts. Why? Why, Job shouts. It is the end of chapter 3, and we have this sort of pregnant pause in the book. Job is still holding on to some hope, and we know this because of the restlessness that he displays in his words. After seven days of silence, Job now hears his friends clear their throats preparing to speak, to say something, anything to ease his torment. And the reader waits with anticipation that some insight, some pearl of wisdom might be dispensed to the one who suffers like Job. But what we are about to see is not comfort, but actually a growing anger and resentment from his friends. For seven days they said nothing, and only after Job expresses how anguished he is do they pontificate and begin to sermonize Job. It is odd that when meeting such a deeply distressed friend, they actually get angry at Job, and we will delve into the why they are so angry next week. The only thing I will say now in preparation for the next part of our journey is that the three friends' response to Job just further underscores how utterly alone he was. Like Jesus on the cross, Job is forsaken. Forsaken by his friends, and at the heart of it all, he feels forsaken by God. Please join me for prayer. O oh God of wonder and infinite grace, God who loves all souls regardless of their history, their ethnicity, their struggles, and even their sins, we marvel at how great your love is. How soon we forget that we can love others and others can love us because you first loved us. And without your love, no one could love their children or even their spouses or their friends, nor could we love you. Your love will cut through all the baggage that we carry, all the nonsense we espouse as the truth, all the posturing and anything else that demeans you or ourselves or others. How true it is that, especially when contemplating your love, 
we see as though through a glass dimly. So much distorts how we see you and others, and especially ourselves. In our anxiety and fear, we claim so-called truths about your love that simply are false. We injure and push away so many people who simply want to know your divine love. And even though Jesus declared from the cross that it is finished, we demand more effort from others to reach our expectations of inclusion in your love. Oh, how presumptuous that is. How dare we put qualifications and expectations on your free grace. We have distorted your gospel, making it out to be about earning our way in, making you seem so vengeful and angry when your son Jesus simply came and offered us, no pleaded with us to come and participate in your good kingdom. Why, O oh God, when Jesus describes your kingdom as a party, like a wedding, do we act and preach like it's a burden or some somber thing like a funeral? Where, O oh God, is our joy? When, O oh God, will we cease to strive to gain something we already have, namely your love and acceptance? Forgive us, Lord. And help us to stop thinking we are the ones who are the gatekeepers to your grace. Help us, we plead, to urge those who are living in a hellish situation to come and find the freedom, the peace, and the hope they so long for. Grant us wisdom and resources to make a difference in our community and moving it from darkness to light. And we pray hunger and poverty and addiction that stalk so many places in our town. We read in your word that your coming will bring new wine and abundant grain. And so we pray that the instruments of death, like drug paraphernalia, will be turned into opportunity and food and hope. Jesus said that the scriptures were fulfilled in the hearing of his home village. So why do we carry on like we're still waiting? We have good news for the poor. We declare release to the captive, recovery of sight, for the blind and the oppressed may be set free. Grant us a surety in our hearts that this time, in this moment, is the year of our Lord's favor. Gracious Lord, we offer our prayer and also our lives in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For in thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, thank you for tuning in. and. Uh, I hopefully we'll be back together in person very, very soon. In the meantime, if we, if I or anyone here at the church can be of assistance to you, uh, please contact us and let us know. I want to conclude our time with a benediction. O oh Christ, you have blessed the members of your body with many and diverse gifts. Now send us forth to bear witness to the oneness of our God and the unity of his church. You have given none of us all the gifts for bringing your kingdom to earth, but you have given each of us some gift for bringing your kingdom to earth. Therefore, let us not hold back, lamenting the gifts we do not have, but instead let us press ahead, employing the gifts that we do have. Amen. God bless you all.